Part 2 of Simplified Solar Forcing – The Short-Term Impacts You can learn more with the in-depth resources listed below the video, but for now, here are the basics of what scientists have discovered. I hope you remember this paper we covered in the morning show just a few days ago. It was discussing how clouds are extremely reactive to solar eruptions and geomagnetic storm conditions. Solar wind, protons and electrons, and cosmic rays intimately interact with the cloud condensation nuclei and electro-attractive activity of dust and water vapor that makes the clouds. And the short-term forcing of weather patterns from solar flares, coronal mass ejections, solar energetic particles, and geomagnetic storms all rapidly impact the ionosphere, which then rapidly works the global electric circuit, which impact not only those electrical components of cloud formation, but the pressure cells, temperature, precipitation, wind, lightning, and more. This is because of the simple fact that every part of space weather has an immediate impact on the ionosphere. Therefore, the global electric circuit as well. Now, while the long-term forcing from the part one video was more about the extended heating lag of these interactions, there are also short-term forcings of individual storms, cells, and localized areas. Solar flares, protons, solar wind, and geomagnetic activity are all paramount, and they are in fact the number one modulator of the ionosphere and the global electric circuit. That's the speed of electromagnetic interactions. It's very quick. Now let's check out two recent videos that can help elucidate these events better with the impact on the cells, wind, and the storms. Hey folks, we're going to learn some basics of electric weather, how the wind follows the flow of electricity in the atmosphere, and one of the most critical aspects of solar climate forcing that is not in climate models. Let's begin with the pressure cells. High and low cells cover the world, and lows, like this blue area, always have the wind twisting into the center. They go counterclockwise like this in the north, clockwise in the south. In the middle, where the air is converging, it does not just disappear, it goes straight up. This is the opposite of high pressure cells, like this one, where the air twists outward from a central point, clockwise in the north, counterclockwise in the south. Now the air spinning outward from the middle doesn't just manifest out of nowhere, it has descended down from above. So in high pressure, the air comes down and spins out, and in low cells, the air twists in and goes up. This is due to the impact of the global electric circuit. In low pressure cells, the atmospheric electricity is largely flowing upward, just like the wind that is spun into the middle, while in high pressure, the opposite is true. The global electric circuit direction is downward, just like the air that comes down and spins out from the center. These are so organized into the high and low cells because of this up and down flow of electric current present all over the world, and the oxygen, the water, and several other gases of the atmosphere are attracted to that electric current and flow with it. Again, downward in high pressure, upward in low pressure. Now while the ground is the floor of this circuit, the ceiling is the ionosphere, that electrified layer at the top of the atmosphere. That's why scientists call it the global electric circuit. It's all around the world and up and down throughout the entire atmosphere. This is why when a solar flare excites the ionosphere, or a coronal mass ejection compresses Van Allen belt electrons down into the ionosphere, or the auroral energy moves towards the tropics in the equatorward traveling waves, the global electric circuit is excited and impacts the flow and the pressure cells below, which then impacts the wind, clouds, temperature, storms, and more. To be clear, this forcing is strong and rapid and completely is missing from climate models. When the sun unleashes a coronal mass ejection, a CME, and it impacts the earth, it excites the magnetic field and triggers electromagnetic activity below throughout the atmosphere. This video is from NASA, and the purpose of the video was meant to describe some of the ways that the sun drives the winds and the ocean currents. It does this by impacting the direct heating of the atmosphere and the electric currents of the global electric circuit. But even NASA's video doesn't cover or even mention that this forcing extends to nearly every aspect of the weather. We have seen the hundreds of papers on how solar activity impacts wind, ocean activity, clouds, rain, lightning, snow, temperature, humidity, and so it should not be surprising that it also impacts the strongest storms in the world, the tropical systems, hurricanes, cyclones, and typhoons. 
This was one of the key aspects of one of the articles we featured earlier today in the morning show. The electrical phenomena of the atmosphere is gaining more and more attention. Where it was once thought to all be about temperature directing pressure in the air masses, scientists now know it is a much more dynamic process. For those who are new here, in Chapter 5 of our textbook, there is a good deal of information about the sun's impact on major tropical storm systems, and extra tropical storms for that matter. There are studies that confirm this connection with solar flares, solar wind data, solar energetic proton storms, and of course, geomagnetic storms from when the CMEs impact our planet. And as they discover this more and more, it extends to the extra tropical regions and even severe thunderstorms over land. Many of you remember Ferris Wald, who won the National Science Championship for proving that coronal hole streams and tropical cyclones were related. A pretty amazing feat for a middle school student. And since our textbook came out, there have been several follow-up studies that only bolster the previously discovered connection between the sun and tropical systems. Ones like this have even suggested it's not just the formation and intensification of those storms, but they're likely tracks to landfall that are impacted by the sun. Other studies dive deep into specific regions of the ocean and find all the same, while also driving into the mechanistic action of how it all works. So this morning's paper, while exciting to see, was not unexpected. Indeed, there are no countervailing studies in the last several years questioning this connection, and yet... The sun's impact on storms remains outside of all climate models. It's a shame. But whether it is solar flare juicing up the atmosphere, the solar wind pressure forcing Van Allen electrons downward, or the geomagnetic storm activity spreading across the globe, the global electric up and down circuit becomes excited. And as we discussed in a video just a few days ago, that electric circuit activity impacts the pressure cells, wind, clouds, and more. And we're back to today. So when this paper came out, and we saw it this morning, about how geomagnetic storm conditions impact the thermospheric winds, which are in the ionosphere, it is, of course, the quintessential example of how these short-term space weather activities impact the world, and quickly. This electrical interaction modulates ozone levels, the global electric circuit, which then impacts lightning, tropical storms, pressure cells, wind, water, and the temperatures throughout the vertical atmospheric column short-term solar forcing. I'll see you in the morning for the daily update. Be safe, everyone.